great. Okay, so well, thank you guys for joining. I'm recording now. And um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle, Gregory, and Halad for joining. So uh, as you know, today is the Network Canvas workshop that, uh, that these folks have, uh, have been gracious enough to like give us to uh, here at the U a better group. Uh, Michelle uh, Birkett, she is a um, um, assistant professor, right, uh, at the uh, the Department of Medical so uh, Social Sciences, and she directs the Complex Systems and Health Disparities Research Program. Um, she is one of the the, the copiers of uh, of Network Canvas, and she uses networks and, and quantitative methodologies to understand um, the social context, uh, contextual influence of stigma and health and well-being of marginalized populations. Um, the uh, Gregory Philip II, he is an, another faculty member uh, at the Northwestern University, and he uses um, uh, complex, uh, he, he's focused on uh, complex epidemiological data and community based evaluations to identify, describe, and address health disparities in marginalized populations. He is also a, 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 co a co I of a copy, copy I, right? Of Network yeah. Canvas. Um, and, and Hala. Uh, Buckhalt uh, is a data assistant associate uh, with the Connect program, the uh, the Complex System and Health Disparities Research Program at Northwestern. That it and, and she is also working uh, with a uh, with Network Canvas, and as I understand, she's been uh, on the nitty gritty components of it. So I think that she will be great to answer the complicated questions. So again, thank you very much for being with us today, and and the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, George, for the invite. And thanks for everybody for being here early on your Friday. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so thank you for the lovely introduction as well. And just to give you an overview of what I hope to do today, um, we hope to do today is to just give you um, an introduction and overview of um, Network Canvas, the software, and then um, hopefully give you a little bit of insight into some of our applications. Um, I want to start by just giving an, a general overview, like orientation of the tool, then I want to move to the website quickly, and then I'm going to um, show you guys actually the applications themselves, starting with interviewer and then going into architect. Um, so that's the plan for today. Um, one thing I want to say too is that like this project is not any one person. This project is really about a team of, of folks here. So three of those folks are here. Um, and I also wanna highlight the other folks on the team. So that's um, Bernie Hogan at Oxford, um, uh, also Joshua Melville, who's our lead developer, um, Patrick Janoulis, um, who's at Northwestern with Gregory and I, um, and I think that's everybody. So it's just, it's very much uh, a team, even if, Gregory and I are MPIs on, on the original R01. So um, this kind of stuff, you know, it's a lot of work. It can't really be done by any single individual. It really has to, you know, it takes a, a village kind of thing. Um, let me go ahead and I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I'm gonna do a lot of juggling today. So let's see, folks can see that. Yes. Cool, okay. So just a brief introduction to like the software overall. And I know it sounds like people are at different places. Some must, might be much more familiar and this, apologies if this is too much uh, big picture information for those, but hopefully this is helpful for folks who are, this is new to them. Um, so, one of the things I want to do first is just to give you um, understanding of some of the underlying principles. Um, so our tool network canvas is um, split into three different applications, um, but each of these work together to provide like an easy workflow for social network data capture um, directly from participants. Um, so we have first architect, which is an application for researchers to visually design network interview protocols and to do it without a lot of complicated scripting. Um, and then the other um, application which, use, which is used quite a bit is interviewer. So that's the application which allows researchers to then administer the network interviews that they've produced within architect and then to administer them within a controlled environment. So 
you know, architect is where you build it. Interview is where you, the interview is actually conducted. Um, architect is what researchers will be touching. Um, and like architect will never be touched by a research participant. That's really for researchers to build the study. Interviewer is something that um, the researchers might be, um, if they're running the interviews themselves, they will have this on their device and then they will be giving this and then what the participant actually interacts with is with an interviewer. And then we have server. So server is an application for researchers to manage both the interview deployment process, as I kind of alluded to just a second ago. Um, so meaning that it is a way for deploying it out to different devices. Um, it's also a way to gain some real time insight into the progress of your data collection. Um, so you can actually look at metrics as data is collected, how many interviews have been done, um, what are some, um, what's the gist of the data um, on average, how many um, nodes are people nominating um, on a specific name generator, for example. Or um, So it's not necessarily where everything, all the data analysis is going to happen, but it can give you a gist, um, an update of what's going on in your study. Um, and then you can also um, use it to export the data for analysis as well. Um, doo -doo -doo. There we go. Um, so, and then, so it's basically like this middle sort of device that sort of deploys things out onto the, the uh, physical hardware that deploys the interviews. And then it also can re receive um, interview data back into it. Um, but as we've um, figured out though, um, for some folks, it just doesn't fit a lot of use cases, at least currently, um, the way that folks are, are tend to have um, their workflows. Um, it, it fits very specific use cases, larger studies where there's a single data manager because server is really stalled on a single device on a single piece of hardware. Um, and for a lot of folks, especially folks getting started, we've just found it kind of unnecessary. It's just overkill that people don't need it. And it's actually a lot simpler to just um, utilize interviewer to just download the, um, the data directly as it's deployed. Um, so I'm, we have this little visual where it actually can kind of disappear a little bit from that workflow. So what I'll be focused on today is mostly architect and interviewer, but like I told George, um, if folks um, have questions about server, want to utilize it, um, you know, we're more than happy to, to go into it, maybe just message us and we can provide some of the um, just guidance on like best practices on using it. Um, in terms of some of the principles um, of, of what we've tried to design, I think one is we've really tried to design it so it's intuitively understood. Um, we've put a lot of work into the visual design of our software, both in terms of like um, what participants see, the participant facing interfaces, so it's really usable for them, and then also into the researcher facing interfaces. So it's also really simple for all of you as well, as much as we you know, can make it simple. Um, this like, um, like focus on visual design, though, it's not just like for aesthetics only, it's not a veneer, it's really much more intended to be a fundamental feature um, that we think is um, kind of differenti differentiates our approach from others. Um, we think that, you know, by having um, nicely designed things and things that are like, you know, um, like we really try to draw upon like a visual metaphor often so that um, data that's very complicated instead um, is, is a little bit um, more tangible because you're actually drawing it, you're actually um, creating it. Um, so people become nodes and nodes are able to be manipulated around the screen. And um, you know you can draw ties between nodes. Like these are the kind of things that I think are, make it a little bit simpler for participants to elicit and a little bit more tangible. So things that are kind of messy and complicated and structural um, can be a little bit more tangible. Um, so yeah, lots of graphical user interfaces, touch. Um, we, we really recommend that if you can try to utilize touch with the data capture, although it's not necessary either. Um, and if you know your device doesn't allow it, it's not um, 
going to necessarily be a, a bad thing. It's just, it, it can be really great if a participant is able to, to utilize touch on the, on the screen. Um, we've also tried to just maximize the flexibility. So everything that we're showing you today, like um, we've, we've really designed like interfaces, but we want those to be within what we've built as maximally flexible as possible. So like folks are like, we've really tried to design things like a name, name generator, but a name generator that can be customized to suit your own needs. So any of the text in terms of, um, you know, uh, what kind of data can be captured, we hope researchers are able to, to make those decisions. Um, but we've just kind of given you the outlines, the sketch of what the interface is able to do, and then we hope that you run with it. Um, so in all aspects of our tool, there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of ways that you can, um, while working within the interfaces that we've created, um, fit them within your research design. Um, we've also really tried to build our tool to be network centric. So meaning that um, it's designed around the needs of network data capture. Um, so nodes and edges are first class building blocks of what we do rather um, than forms or variables. It's really um, nodes and edges is what our tool is most meant to do. Um, one thing you might find is that um, when it comes to collecting data on individuals, um, tools like REDCap are probably better in many ways. Um, so things that are um, asking for many, many different items um, from about an individual, um, it depend, you know, you can try it out for yourself, but in, in our experience, I mean, it, it probably still makes sense to utilize existing tools when you have a large component of your research that is going to be focused on individuals, but especially for network focused questions, that's where our tool, it's really meant um, to shine. Um, another part of our tool is that it's designed to be in person and interviewer assisted. So as designed currently, all of our software is installed on researcher controlled devices. And then it's designed to be walked through with a research assistant, with an interviewer, um, and in sort of a, a co-production of the data. Um, one reason for that is um, for one, like the concern for just the, the, the um, security of data and making sure that that workflow is very secure. Another is that by focusing on that, we're able to, by focusing on interview capture, uh, data capture within interviews that are in person, the interviewer is there to help navigate people through. And so we can focus our interfaces a lot more on just the data capture instead of the instructing people into what is the interview about? How do you use the tool? Um, when this is brand new to you as a participant. So that's, you know, a decision we've made, but also we realize that that doesn't meet the needs of everybody. And a lot of people don't necessarily, um, you know, that they need to do for whatever reason, their data capture remotely. In the long term, that is where we want to go. We want to move to a, a little bit of a different model, but one of the limitations of our tool right now is that that's where it's really designed. Um, we have heard of fo some folks who are utilizing Zoom um, and you know sharing screens. It's not ideal, it's not optimal because these screens are really meant to be engaged with physically in person. Um, but at the same time, it's one way, especially during the pandemic that a lot of folks have been getting around this and trying to still you know, do their research, but within a context that did not allow people to be physically present with each other. Um, and I've alluded to a couple of different things, um, but just to give you a sense of like where we do want to go, um, we're very interested in remote data capture. Um, we're very interested as well and sort of um, with this idea of like what we've learned with server is the importance of multiple folks to be able to access the data within a team and also to be able to like design the tool because right now protocol files are really designed by one person and then they can be easily shared. But then if when you're working within a team and everybody wants to work on it, you know, I want to tweak this item, I want to tweak this question, it's a lot of passing around to files. And so 
our sort of thought for the future is what we want to do is we really are interested in a cloud model where there's a um, like a, a studio where folks are logging into everybody in the team has different abilities to um, you know just like a lot of other sort of survey tools that already exist that can design things that can access things can export the data from there um, so that's that's the big picture goal but for now um, we're really thinking about um, everything is uh, locally installed on, on your own devices um, so just just something to be aware of and you know for the future what we kind of think of that we we hope to still support all of what we've already done but sort of add this new component so um, both are available for depending on what kind of research you're doing and then another priority of ours has been um, just being designed to be open source um, we think that a key to sustaining this work is input and collaboration with the community um, the code itself is completely open source the software is free to use um, we established a 501c3 entity, the Complex Data Collective, or Codico, to support our tool. Um, it's licensed under GPL v3, um, and we have a GitHub, which you're more than welcome if you know you're technically inclined to to visit to contribute. Um, yeah, people can even build out their own sort of features, and um, the only thing is that for us to roll it into the main release, it would have to be up to We'd have to make sure that it was not breaking anything, um, but people are always able to build out their own features as well if if they have that technical skill. Um, so it was released in December of 2020. That was the full release. We've still made some updates since then, but that was the full release. And since then, it's been really amazing just to see like all the different areas, all the different ways that it's been used. Um, getting to see other folks in other countries use it. Um, I also mentioned a little bit earlier, we're very curious and, and it's really helpful for us to like keep funding going to know how it's being used, especially when it's being used in NH funded research because our, our work is NH funded. Um, so if you are, um, if, if there are any um, NH funded studies that are using it, we would love to know that kind of information. So that's either sharing it with any of us here right now, even if you want to send us a message um, or just sending us uh, an email at info at networkcanvas.com, any of those things. Um, and we would love to brag about that in upcoming grant submissions and RPPR submissions. Um, so the next thing I want to do, any questions so far before I move on? I have a quick question. If yeah. we like to, um when you talked about design to maximize flexibility, and again, yeah. I understand this is more network, not individual, but um, you were saying you can do name generators that are customizable. So yeah. if we were doing studies where we wanted people to be able to articulate their own pronouns or just get, that, that's something that we could modify or is that is that not something we could modify? Like with their name, I don't know, like- Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm, Absolutely. I'm thinking of doing some work with sexual gender minorities. So I just want to be, make it as yeah. um, uh, applicable and user friendly. Um, but okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We, we certainly appreciate that for sure. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, those are the kinds of things that, you know, um, the kind of variables that are captured about individuals are, you know, very up to the researcher to, to determine. Um, so that that should be no problem in terms of adding that but thanks um before i get into the software itself i just want to show the website really quick um just to orient you all about some of the the things that you can find here um so one is that um let's see so this is our website um first you can download either here you can also download over here um so these are the three different applications they are available on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Play, Android Play. Um, they're kind of available on the App Store, but not 100%. So we've had issues with the Apple App Store recently. The, there is a, we do have Network Canvas. Um, the full version is available, version 6.0, on the App Store. for. So this really impacts iPad. But when we've tried to update it 
uh, more recently, we've had run into issues because they, they see us as, as health data, even though we collect absolutely no information from our, our researchers. Um, and and um, because of that, they there's just like these ridiculous hoops they want us to jump through. So um, Apple is very frustrating to work with sometimes. So for now, we are pointing people away from using iPads. Um, if for some reason you absolutely like need to need to do this, get in touch with us. We might be able to figure out some sort of way to like make it work for you. But in general, it's probably a little bit easier for you to look at some other um, devices to use. I have um, a question. Yeah. Yes. So how about, um, have you guys tried it out with uh, uh, Chromium? Sorry, I'm thinking about uh, 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 the operating system, um, Chromebook, sorry. Oh, like Android? Yeah, I, yes. I, I think that's Android, right? So, yes, yep, right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, because I'm thinking yep. that that's, uh, that's way cheaper than an iPad. Way cheaper, way cheaper. You can still get touch. Um, yeah, so I, I, okay. I, would, I, would, I would try it out. I would get one device and um, make sure that you know, there's no issues, but we certainly, um, we know of some researchers who are using it with Android. Um, we've tested it with Android. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, that sort of um, environment is changing so quickly that in, you know, a couple of years ago when we started to do this, like the options for touch devices were much more limited, but it's, it's pretty amazing um, how many different tools there are out there and how they're, they just pro proliferated. Um, other things I want to show you real quick. We have a little video here. You can go ahead and watch. If you want to um, sign up for our mailing list, you can go ahead and do that here. Um, we don't email very often, like maybe every six months or so, an update. Um, and then, of course, Twitter and things like that. And then the next thing we want to show you on the website is just our documentation. So this is where our documentation lives. Um, you'll find a lot of things here in terms of um, installation information, FAQs, um, all kinds of things. There's also a number of tutorials, some how-to guides, specifics on different interfaces, and I'll introduce you to some of these, but this is, you know, if you have really specific questions, this is where you're going to find it. Um, some key concepts, et cetera. Um, we also have a couple of different um, citations that might be helpful as well. Um, we have some evaluations of the software. Um, we have a publication in social networks looking at the design of the software. Um, and then you can also always go to our GitHub as well. So the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, anything, any questions so far, I'm gonna next um, show you guys an actual network canvas interview protocol. I have one question, um, actually, yeah, out of curiosity, if, if it could be ever used on a mobile phone or, if, or is that way too small to do it? We want to get there, absolutely. Um, so we are thinking about that for the next um, R01, is that that's what we're hoping to do. Um, but it certainly does change the kinds of interfaces that you can use. Um, so I think that's going to be some of our work is how to make it um, usable on a very small screen. Um, but I, I think it's absolutely possible. I think it, it one of the complications is just that not all of the interfaces, we, I think we're going to have to design some um, mobile friendly interfaces, um, whereas these have really been optimized for, you know, a little bit larger screens. But that's the plan. Yeah, that would really broaden the reach, I guess. And applicability, yeah. But I can imagine it has its challenges to make it that way. Yeah, yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. that, it's hard. It's like such a fine line between, um, yeah, wanting to like reach everybody, but then also like to ensure that those participants have a good experience in the data collection and the data quality is good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, can I bother you with another please. question? Please. Yes. So I was wondering because right now, well, this is for curiosity too, <laughs> to be honest, because you were mentioning about the backup of the information and the uh, the data that you collect, uh, and I was wondering if we, with the server, 
uh, in some point there is some kind of backup that the university get of the data because sometimes when you get through ethical approval sometimes they ask you where is the data and they ask you where is the whole process of the data like where is in every part mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. so I was wondering if you I don't know uh, can explain a little bit what happened with yeah. the data in there just in server so like um it's not your it's not going to be the home for all of your data forever it's not going to be like where everything lives and, and happens we more saw this as a way of especially when you have like thinking about like some studies we've been involved in when you have 20 different devices and 20 different interviewers and they're all doing interviews and then every day they are going to be pushing everything back to server and then you'd have a single data manager who is then able to um, see what's coming in to then pull it into a secure um, you know uh, whatever like its long-term storage place will be um, so it was never supposed to be the place that everything resided in um, it's really the place that sort of collects everything and then as a researcher then you would have um, the responsibility of figuring out um, where it's going to be stored how it's going to be structured all of that um, so just to you know give you a sense it's not necessarily like the home but also you know everything's encrypted everything is um, set up as as much as possible to be completely secure so sorry I, I, thank you one, one thing to mention I don't know if you guys have um I worry, but there's a, there's this great software that's called Arclone that is designed to uh, make build backups. Uh, hmm. Nice thing about it is that it it connects with uh, everything. So, for example, I've been in in high performance computing environments in which you don't have user interface, but you need to like uh, sync something else, and you can connect it with Dropbox, with Box, with I don't know. They have like a twenty different tools. Hmm. And it's supported on um, uh, uh, encrypted like transmission of information. So, uh, and yeah, so in case uh, you haven't, uh, you didn't know about it, I, I recommend you to take a look at it if, if you are interested about it, that kind of stuff. It's, and it's open source software as well. That's awesome. Uh, it's our clone. You put it in, into the chat. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, and thinking about a lot of uh, here, it will be great if uh, Network Canvas have something like that, like backup mm -hmm. or suggestions or uh, a way to integrate with it because this is. I find our plan to be great. Yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in looking into this just for my own, like, <laughs> research workflow, but, um, but no, that, that's really cool. I think one of the things that we've tried to do is, like, we, we've kind of always said, like, we really need to limit our scope to do, like, the more we limit our scope, the more we're going to be able to do what we do, like, see in our scope really well, and the things that are outside, you know, Ugh, you know, we'll have to leave that to other folks. So when it comes to network analysis, like we don't necessarily see that as our scope. And then a lot with the data in terms of, there's only so, like we want to make the data easily usable and, and safe and secure for everybody. But yeah, like when you start getting into long-term data management and things, we have to say, because especially because we're building for so many different users, like some with who have experience with high performance computing and then some who like barely know R, you know, so being able to like meet the the needs of all of those folks across different domains is just kind of impossible for us. So because of that, um, I'll, I'll get into it, but, you know, one of the things we do is we export into either GraphML or CSV because those are fairly usable for a wide range of folks. Um, and then we kind of leave it up to to our users to as to what next steps are. Um, but yeah. So it, that's just sort of where I think our priorities have been more on like the actual data capture. But I think you, you're making some good points. And I think there's some things here that we can think be important for us to think about um, as we move to the next stages. Yeah, that sounds like an app in for uh, an, in an, another R1 or R21. <laughs> uh, yeah. As it goes, right? <laughs> Everything's always fodder for the, the next grant. Oh, um, okay, so what you guys, I think, should be seeing, right? You guys see Interviewer, is that correct? Cool. Um, so this is Interviewer. Let me just walk you through this very briefly. 
So again, this is the application that will be used to run the network um, Canvas protocols that are created with an architect. Um, this will be the one that you know you kind of load in a protocol, you run it, and then the participant is entering data in. Um, so we have a little welcome screen. You can turn this off if you'd like. Over here, you can watch our that same video. You can visit our documentation website. You can also install a sample protocol, which I recommend that you do if you haven't, just because it's a great way before you even build a protocol to just see what it looks like. Um, and I can walk us through one of those protocols here. Um, so this interface, either you can start, these are different, this is a protocol file. You can also choose from other protocol files that might exist. Um, you can also, these are different interviews that have been created with a protocol file. So this was just named Testo1, and it was using sample protocol version three. You can also manage and export data from this screen. So say that you do, you have done several interviews with folks, you can go ahead and you can export it, start the export process. I'm just gonna cancel that out. You can also import protocols from URL. So that's really cool. But if you wanna share it with somebody, you don't even have to you know, necessarily even send the file. You can even host it online, send a URL and then share it. You can import it from file. And then this is where you might pair a server. So if you are using the server app, this is how you sort of get your local device with interviewer connected to server if you wanna transmit the data that way. Um, one more thing I'm gonna show you before I jump into the protocol is just settings. So this is another important place to look just in case, you know, you want to um, just mess with the visual um, interface just a little bit. You can do scaling. You can just make it look as nice as you want for that particular device. Um, default export options, pairing. So just to make you aware that that exists. Um, let's go into a network canvas interview, a very basic one. This is just our sample protocol, just to give you a sense of what this looks like big picture. The first thing we do whenever we are entering into a network canvas interview is it's going to ask you for entering a case ID. This is whatever it is in your study that you are using to identify this participant in some way. So I'm just going to say test 02 here, start interview. So this protocol has been set up to demo all of our interfaces to give you a really wide sample of what Network Canvas can do. Um, it doesn't, you know, this is likely overkill. It's pretty long. Um, another thing that this protocol does, it has a lot of screens like this that explain what you're about to do, um, which could be great, um, you know, if you're doing an interview as well. Um, but just to give you a sense of like, that's how this is laid out. Um, I wanna orient you to the timeline. So the timeline here is able to be clicked on and what you're able to see is all of the different stages here. And I think there's 30 some, 31 different stages. And this allows you to actually jump through the interview. Um, so what is stage here? A stage is basically a collection of screens that are meant to for doing one sort of data capture, okay? And every stage is usually uses in, in network canvas interface. And we'll kind of get into these different interfaces. And the way this um, the way this protocol has been set up, you can kind of see just with the the names of these stages, we've really tried to focus on, demoing certain kinds of interfaces. So this is when we talk about the ego form. And we talk about a number of different name generators. We talk about the sociogram. And then we have a number of different name elicitation, not, um, name interpreter um, time, types of interfaces that we show, um, the narrative interface as well. So just to give you a sense. Um, a, while we're on the timeline, one thing I want to say too is that the really nice thing about Network Canvas is that if people forget somebody and they remember later in the interview, you're absolutely able to go back using this timeline 
and go back to where you need to for that name generator and then add that person. The only thing you're gonna have to do is just then walk through each of the, the preceding screens to enter that person's data. So you, it'll be pretty quick because you're only entering data on one person, but it's absolutely possible to, to, to do that. And that was important for us. Um, and then the way that you go through a network canvas interview is by scrolling and go back and go forward. And you'll be hitting each of these stages. Um, and one more thing I wanna show you before we start going through the stages is this menu. This menu is really important because it can give you a sense of how long you've been in this interview. If you made a, a mistake in the case ID, you can modify it here. You can keep track of how many nodes have been created in your interview. So say, you know, I only want 10 people across my name generators. You can check that there. You can check how many edges or which edges are being captured in this. Um, yeah. Okay, now I'm gonna start going through some of these stages. Again, this is just a demo of what an information interface looks like. You can embed videos, you can embed um, pictures, words, all that. Um, the next form I'm gonna show you, or the next stage I'm gonna show you is the ego form. So this is an example of what it might look like. Um, this is data meant to, for data captured about an individual. All of this can be modified um, and set up for what you need. Uh, English, so just to give you a sense of the kinds of different input controls we have available within the ego form. So you can have a sense, you absolutely can capture data at the ego level, the, the person uh, who's, who's in that interview. But if you have really a ton of different items and questions, this kind of look might take a little while um, if you have a really long survey. So that's why I would say you might want to think about other tools like RedCap or SurveyMonkey or whatever it is that you utilize. Okay, now we're going to get into, we showed the ego form. I want to show you now a couple of different ways um, to actually generate uh, nodes, um, name generators. Um, we're going to demo several different ones. Um, and each of these will generate your network and each of them has strengths or, or weaknesses um, and so you kind of have to think for your own data collection what is um, what is it that is important to you so you can kind of see a little video demo of this okay within the past six months who have you felt close to or discussed important matters with i'm just going to put a couple of instead of writing names and i'm just going to put some numbers this is called the quick add name generator so it's really quick, it's really fast. Um, so if you really prioritize getting a lot of names really quickly, and um, this might be the name generator for you. Um, let me show you now a different one. This is now a name generator using a side panel. So it's very similar, but now it's um, you can actually pull data that was just input on the previous screen. Um, so within the past six months, who have you discussed social networks with? So. I've discussed social networks with two and four, um, but then also five and six. Okay. Now this is an example of a name generator using forms. Um, in the past 12 months, which clinics or healthcare providers have you visited? Um, Northwestern. So this takes a little bit longer because I'm actually inputting data about the node as well. As I'm nominating them, as I'm putting their name in, I'm also putting information in here. Um, so you can see though how that might impact certain for certain interviews and participants. If this is a little slower process, it might make it a little bit unlikely that people are going to give you 20 individuals if this is slower. Um, so just something to think about is that how you decide to structure your data capture might impact the resulting data. So we want you to try all of these things out and, and think through these. Can, Can I, I ask a question, yeah. Michelle? Yeah. So say that you were going to do some individual data on RedCap. Can you <clears throat> preface 
this form so that they can just do a drag and a drag and drop and make it less time consuming for them? Like if they've already given you some of that, or is that kind of crossover and defeat mm. the whole purpose? As of now, we don't have any automated way of pulling data exactly from REDCap. Um, we have like researchers have done it when they have utilized like RAs to um, like, so say they've pulled data from wave one and now this is wave two and I want to input data into network canvas that maps onto their data at wave one, just to make it a little bit more streamlined and easy. Or maybe they have even nodes captured at wave one that they then enter into wave two. So they don't even have to do a name generator in the same way. So that's absolutely possible. It might be hard to do with the same um, interview um, just because, I mean, it, it also could be possible. We have done that where we have had, for example, people who were queried in depth about certain individuals in their lives. And then the research assist, like the red cap survey would spit out a couple of those names of those people. And then the researcher um, would enter that into the network canvas and then utilize network canvas for more networky kind of questions about those people. So it's possible, but you just have to really think about the workflow. It's, we haven't made it super, super easy for you basically. Okay, one more name generator I wanna show you is with roster data. So with rosters, we also like folks can pull in individuals. So let's say, um, let's see, this is a very large roster. So let's say, uh, Goose, let's say Magdalena. I'm gonna add those folks over. Um, we can also sort by first name, by last name. So these are things that you can enter roster data in as an asset when you're building a network canvas protocol and then actually draw from it. Let me just draw a couple people in. Cool, let me go in. Uh, which universities have you visited or studied at? Northwestern and Illinois. I was in here. There we go. Cool. And then, okay. So that those are all the name generators, um, just to give you a sense of them. And now I want to show you. Um, some other ways of, of getting information. So one thing, um, you know, once you get nodes, you're going to then want to get a lot of information about those nodes. Tell us more information. Um, so these are different ways that you can go ahead and, um, you know, so for these universities, oh, I, I visited or I study there. Um, let me go through a couple of these. Visited. Okay. Let me show you guys a sociogram. So this is how edges are created between our nodes. So not necessarily um, by, by nominating um, an individual, that might be how you're determining that um, an edge has been created between the ego and their altar. What this is great for is actually creating ties between the altars themselves. So for here, we're asking, please position the people you have um, named amongst the concentric circles, place people who know each other together, put people who are closer to towards the center of the circles. So the idea here is that people have a pretty good sense of who knows who. So I, I like to always ask them, like just to lay people out first, and people will tend to cluster people together that they know. And then you can go ahead we'll actually come back to that layout in a second. You can also um, utilize other ways of laying out folks. So this is a different type of layout where you're actually putting in some sort of image and then asking folks to lay them out. Um, so just, you can be very creative here. The concentric circles are um, automatic, like that's what will be um, utilized unless you put something else in, but you do have the ability to put something else in. So now we're gonna show you creating edges on the sociogram. You're gonna see that original layout. So you can load that layout back. It's the exact same layout. The participants already familiar with it. This looks, you know, they, they understand like who these people are and how they're, they're laid out. And now we're gonna ask, please connect any two people who might spend time together without you being there. So edges are able to be created pretty simply. And we think because people are near each other, it'll be easier for the participant to sort of understand um, who's there and who should be connected and who shouldn't. So it makes 
edge generation pretty quick. You can also capture multiple kinds of edges. So this is conflict now. Okay, well actually these people all conflict. Something like that maybe. Um, this one is dyad census. So this is something that is relatively new. So this is a very different way of, of generating edges, but if you wanted to do it in a very rigorous way where you're absolutely going to be comparing everybody, this is a way that you can go ahead and do that pretty quickly. Um, name interpreter techniques. So this will just give you a sense quickly of some of the ways that you can um, elicit more information about the edges. Um, not, I'm sorry, about the nodes, not the edges. So for this, this is um, an interface where you're actually just selecting individuals on the networks that have already been created. Please select anyone you have previously asked for advice in the previous six months. Um, this. Okay. Please select anyone who has supported you financially in the previous six months. Say these people. Another way. Who have you communicated with? Um, so you can kind of get a sense of like the speed at which a lot of data can be captured. Um, it's a little bit easier than asking individually. When was the last time you communicated with number one? Last and how often? <laughs> last 24 hours, last week, last six months, last two years. So this is a way of kind of doing all of that data capture pretty quickly. Again, you can ask about number each of these individuals, which is their relationship to you? How do they know you? Um, if you want to um, move something, it should be pretty intuitive for you to do that. We obviously support skip logic, network filtering. Um, let's see. Let's just scoot ahead a little bit. The narrative interface is also really cool. We actually don't collect data on this interface at all. But what it does is it gives you a really nice way of um, the researcher can determine what network is shown. And then this is like a great conversational piece. So if you're doing more qualitative work, if you're quartering the, your conversation, this could be a great way of um, showing the network back to the participant and then having them interact with it in different ways. Um, having different presets maybe. So say you want to focus on material support. Um, you can go ahead and put that there and then have the conversation. Oh, these are the people you said that gave you material support. Tell me about that. Um, yeah. So very cool interface. And then you finish your interview. Now that data is able to be exported. Manage and export data, test O2. Export selected file, start the export process. So that data can be immediately exported. And I'm going to just show you very briefly what that looks like. Where did that go? Do, do, do. Okay, let's just unzip it real quick. And then this is what you're going to get. So I exported both um, GraphMLs and also CSV. I'm just going to walk you through. GraphML is a file that contains everything that is in the CSVs like already. So it's it's really meant. It's a it's a graph structure. Um, whereas when you are using CSVs, you're going to have a lot of different data files, most likely depending on how complicated your, your network capture was. So what you're going to see here, you're going to see the case ID is the name. Um, at the front of all of these. You're also going to have an identifier, a very long identifier that's given across all of this particular interview. Um, so you can help match uh, the files together. Michelle, um, yes. We have one hand up and another question. It's probably mm -hmm. easier to answer verbally than for me to answer in the chat. Absolutely. Go for it. So you can start with the raised hand. Oh, okay. Just before you move on from interviewer, I yeah. had a question about, um, you know, when you're an architect, there's a place to um, insert your script, the interviewer script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, how can you view that script that you entered when you're in interviewer? 
you can't view it within Interviewer as things are configured currently. So it's kind of seen more as like a code book script that you have like next. It's, so you're not going to see it on the actual screen that the interview is ha having. We sort of see it as an addendum. So as of right now, it would probably be easiest to have that printed out to, if your participants need it, to have it like as a resource there, especially as you're training interviewers, we see that as being really useful. Um, but it's not necessarily, because like in one thought is like, we don't want to take up the screen real estate in giving that kind of information versus the data capture itself. Um, we. I could also see it as like, you know, an interviewer device, whereas like maybe there's a tablet being handed to the participant and then you have it also like open on the interviewer's device. So, okay, perfect. That was my plan. I just wanted to confirm that that was, that, that was correct. Thank yep. you so much. Absolutely. And then I thought the, uh, I asked Hall, but it's probably easier for us to talk about, about restricting the diet census to a subset of all pairs. I know we talked about that. Is mm -hmm. that something we've actually implemented or is that still something planned? I Re restricting the diet census to a, like a subset, a subset. of every, yeah. I think so. I think you should be able to filter um, on that interface. I, I would probably have to try it out to be 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure you can filter in all of the, all of these interfaces, all these stages can can utilize filtering. Um, so I think that should be no problem um, if you yeah. want to do like a subset. You just want to make sure that obviously you captured whatever piece of data that's going to help filter folks in. So like women, for example, and making sure you know you've captured uh, that someplace, and then like filtering. Oh, I only want folks who identify as women to be in this diet census, for example. And then the, the other one was, if someone straddles two arenas for how do they know you, how do you address that? I mm. I think we, we've dealt with that multiple ways. Yeah, I think it depends on your study. I think, you know, um, my, my general sense is like, um, I would tend to tell um, participants of like whatever, is the main way, like what is the primary way, how, whatever that is that they identify. But it is something for you to think about in terms of for data capture, when that happens really often and there isn't a simple solution, then you might wanna think about doing multiple relationship types. That's what we've done. It's like, um, is, is there another way that you know this person and asking the question twice for every person that they can nominate two different kinds of ways they know somebody. Um, so for example. Anything else? Cool. Yeah, so when, oh, go ahead. When I'm um, uh, restricting the in the diet, uh, uh, diet census, is it possible to like a, a, a specify like a logic condition between uh, within between the diet? Right. So, for example, imagine that I I just want to set up uh, the diet census for um, male versus female. So only male and, male and female pairs, for example. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Because as, as you mentioned, you, you, you can like restrict to a subpopulation of individuals, but can you like mix both of them? Like to say, okay, I just want to compare, build dance between these pairs of this type of pairs. I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. I think you're just gonna do the stage multiple times. And for each one, you're probably going to have a different filter. So for one, you would filter for example, with women, the next one you would filter with men, something like that. Um, so it would be a way of making sure there's no ties in between, I guess. Right, but would, would that be, for example, uh, uh, I guess so, uh, between just men and um, women, instead of like fixing one subtype of individuals, but rather I just want to see uh, how individuals perceive the ties between, uh, um, uh, between male and female. I, I don't think we can do that. That is, because like to limit it to only yeah. males can only be paired with females as potential like partners. I don't think we can do that. But what I would suggest, I mean, that might be something that maybe our software doesn't limit, but instead it's something that the interviewer helps guide. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, like asking them in like an edge elicitation task of like, 
you know, not, I wouldn't do it in the pairwise necessarily because it might not make sense in that pairwise situation. But if you have the sociogram screen, I think that would, might make sense with an interviewer just directing them and saying like, well, maybe you want to put all the women over on here on this side of the screen, all the men on this side, and then you can make linkages right there across or leave them in the layout that makes most sense to the participant, but just ask them. Um, I want you to make connections between men and women who X, Y, Z. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's, there's a lot of little nuanced things here that like we try to be as inclusive as possible, but sometimes we sort of hit those limits. Um, yeah. One thing that we are, um, and it, this isn't a feature yet, but it's in um, a future release that we hope to come out in the next few months, is um, having two different types of nodes on the screen on one, at one time. So having two mode networks and being able to create edges both between um, the, both different types of nodes. So that might, you know, be another way that you could explore once that feature is enabled. But um, so yeah, I'm not going to dive too too much into the um, the, the data side here, but just I just want to make a point is that um, each of these, I, I've highlighted the CSV data files specifically, and there's also this graph ML right here, but the CSVs here, the reason there's so many is because you have, actually, I'm just going to walk through each of these. The, the top file is for the node type classmate. It's attributes of those classmates. So you can open it up. Well, I opened them all now, but you can kind of start to see what the data actually looks like. Let me go and pull classmate. So we pulled in three different classmates and these are their names. That's the information. There might be way more attributes if you were to ask a lot of different items and questions about those folks. We ask name um, and then we have our, our um, different identifiers that will help you link those alters um, to the rest of the interview. Um, anyways, let me go back. I'm, going to actually just walk through these. So then you have attribute list for clinics, another node type, attribute list for persons, another node type, attribute list for universities, another node type. And then you have two different edges, conflict and then no. And so your edge list is going to be, oh, of course. <laughs> uh, anyways, but your edge type is going to be something like this. So you're going to have these different identifiers, which are found in the attribute files for each node type. And you can see which ones are connected to which, which one is the source, which is the target. So to give you a sense, let's make that disappear. So that is what the data looks like. Let's move on. And I suggest we now move to looking at architect. Let's see real quick. Okay, I'm gonna close this quickly. Okay, can folks see that okay? Awesome. So architect is going to be the application that you're actually designing your network canvas interview in. Um, looks very familiar, it's similar kind of welcome screen as we have an interviewer. Again, you can turn this on and off. Um, overview video documentation website. Um, what you're going to see here, you're going to have some, these are different protocols again, that are already installed. You can go ahead and use Architect to resume editing them. You can also use Architect to either create a new protocol or to open an existing protocol. Uh, I'm just gonna show you quickly what it looks like to create a new protocol. You're just going to wanna name it. Uh, protocol. All Network Canvas protocols end with um, dot .net canvas. Go ahead and create it. This is what you're going to um, begin with. Um, this is where you can put a description. And I will go through these in, when I'm showing you a more full protocol, but this is um, where you're going to find a lot of things that are gonna be very helpful for you um, when it comes to the protocol. And you're just gonna start building stages. Stages are able to be accessed by just 
pushing this plus button, it's going to ask you for a new stage. You're going to get a whole different list of all of the different stages that are available, all the different interface types for that stage that you can use. Um, if you aren't 100% sure what you want to do, one way of starting is by filtering the different interfaces by their capabilities. So if you just know, okay, my first step in my interview, I want to create notes. Okay. So you can go ahead and just push that and it will just show you the subset of interfaces that are able to create notes. Um, let's say I want to create edges. It'll go ahead and give you the options for how do you create edges. Uh, I want to uh, capture node attributes. And these are the different ways of doing that. So we hope that's one way of making this a little bit easier. Um, and you just kind of go through and just start adding these stages. I'm going to go through and show you one that is already a little bit completed. I'm going to return to the start screen real quick. I'm not going to save this, just discard my changes. I'm going to resume editing. Let's see. I'm going to do this one. This is um, a version that we created, I think, for one of our workshops. It's very, very simple. Um, I'm going to give you a quick sense of it just by previewing it for you. We have a preview function. And can folks see this OK? I think somebody might be unmuted, by the way. OK. So this is this preview function. Can, can you guys see the, the preview of it? Yeah, cool. Um, so this preview function is a great way of seeing what the protocol looks like without having to actually put it into interviewer. So when you're in architect, you're able to actually see it. Um, so you can just run through this just like this was in interviewer. So I'm just going to go really quickly and just show you, uh, give you a sense of what this protocol looks like really quickly. Think about the people you know, who do you feel close to, who do you discuss important matters with? So something like this. And then we position people um, in the circles. Okay, connect people who spend time together. Okay. Uh, who are your family members in the network? Um, how do you communicate with them? Just a really simple. Um, here's some information about the ego. Go ahead. And then we have another note type in here too. We also have a note type about who are your favorite musicians or composers. So let's say uh, A and B. Cool. And then which musicians and composers have you listened to in the last 48 hours? Uh, let's say just A, B, and C. And where did you hear about those folks? And that's the interview. That's, that's this protocol that we are looking at right now, just to give you a sense of what we're looking at. OK, so this is just the preview. So I'm going to go back real quick. And I'm going to show you this is what it actually looks like when you're constructing it. So each of these stages, that interview that we just went through, is all right here. And you can kind of see there's seven different stages. Each of these stages. So we started with an information screen. Cancel. Then we go to a name generator. You can see the different node types here. Cancel. Sociogram, ordinal bin, ego form. And then we have another name generator at the end, and then some information about where you heard about that. I'm going to show you a few more things about this protocol, too. So these will make a lot more sense now. Um, we had somebody mention the, print, the printable summary, the code book. Um, so this is a feature that we added after working with a a lot of different researchers who are trying to train their interviewers. 
and, and really how do we summarize a lot of complicated information really quickly. Um, so a lot is in here and we think this might be really useful in a lot of different ways. So what this does is it creates a document that is either printable or you can save to PDF um, and it summarizes first what protocol exactly is this. It summarizes the different stages, the contents of that interview. So you'll see all of the different stages there. It's clickable, so there's links built in. It shows you um, all of the different node types. So you do have two different types of nodes here. You have people, person, and musician. You also have one type of edge type, friends. And you do have some assets in here, meaning there's either video, images, network, something embedded within the Network Canvas protocol. Here, it's just an image. And then for each of these stages, you can go through and you can see a little preview of it and you can put an interview script in here. Um, this might be really useful for you um, or maybe you know not necessarily useful. We find it's, it's useful for either interviewers or for data managers, because it's also a nice way of sort of understanding how the data is being captured. Um, especially, well, this stage is an information screen. No gen data is generated on the information screen, so you don't see anything there. But on the next one, you have a name generator and you start to see variables. So here on the name generator screen, um, you have people who are um, generated and then the variable associated with them is name. You also have, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. On the sociogram, um, you'll have variables that are created here, our family member, and then also layout, excuse me, clicked, um, family member and layout. And then you can see the specific prompts that were used to generate layout, the specific prompts that were used to generate friends, and the specific prompts that were used to generate family member. So this can be really nice for just keeping track of what is in your protocol and making sure that everything is as it should be. Another thing that's really cool here is, and you saw me do it a second ago, is that you can click here and then it'll take you down to the bottom where this variable is also described in more depth. So towards the bottom, after we go through all the different stages, you will have for egos, what are all the ego level variables? And these are what they are. This is the name of the variable that's associated with ego. This is the um, input control that was specifically used. So we have a number of different input controls that make sense or, or don't for different kinds of variables. Is it just free text? Is it uh, date time? Is it something else? So that gives you a sense of how the data was captured. And then where exactly was it used? It was used in ego form. Um, and then for person, you see all of the different variables. Again, you can see the um, input control. For this one, you can also see specifically what values are able to be entered and what the labels associated with those are. For musician, these are the variables. Again, values and labels. And friends, just that they exist, edges exist, but not no no variables are captured on the edge itself. So yeah, that is the code book. We hope that's a really useful feature for folks. I I know for me, I'm very excited about it because it, in practice, when actually doing these, it, it feels already very useful. So in addition to that printable summary. We also have a resource library. This is where if you have anything that you want to put into your Network Canvas interview to utilize, this is where you can put it. So again, images, videos, audio, or networks if you're utilizing rosters, this is where you would put it. And then we also have a non-printable codebook, which gives a lot of the information that was actually in that printable version, but embedded in. And the nice thing here is that you can actually click this and it'll take you to the actual stage. So if you want to make sure that 
something is configured correctly, you can really find where is that variable exactly <laughs> so you don't get lost within your own protocol. So let's say I want to go to musician and uh, where heard of, where exactly is that? And you can go ahead and find that exactly. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to um, just show you guys like adding some stages. Um, let's just do, so one thing I wanna say is that you can add a stage anywhere. So you can go ahead and add one here or here in between. Um, I'm gonna just do it over here at the edge. Um, let's see, let's do capture node attributes. I really like the ordinal bin. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's do something about musicians and how about frequency listened to? Um, so this is the stage name. This is what's going to appear over in the timeline. So it's helpful to have a name that will help people navigate to that, that place. I'm gonna select what kind of node I'm getting information on. I'm getting um, I'm getting information on the node musician, not people, but musician. Um, I could filter here, but I'm not. I'm going to add a prompt, and my prompt is going to be, um, how often do you listen to this musician? Okay, um, I'm going to then create an ordinal variable. So this is the variable that's now going to be entered into my code book and it's going to be captured through my protocol. I'm going to create a new variable and it's just going to be um, freak listen enter. So I have a new variable now. My variable type is ordinal. Um, it's now asking me create some controls for this input control. Okay, um, so let's see. My label, label is what the participant sees and the value is what happens to the data on the back end. So for the frequency that I'm listening to this musician, let's say label is every day um, and that is four. Um, let's say um, weekly and that is three. Let's say monthly. Um, that is two. And then let's say uh, less than monthly. And that is one. Cool. Save and close. Okay. So it looks like we have our different options here. It's asking me what color scheme I want to use. Let's try pink. Uh, that looks good to me. So now I'm going to preview it. Let's see how this looks. Cool. How do, how often do you listen to this musician? Every day, weekly, monthly, or less than monthly? Awesome. So I'm happy with the way that looks. Let me see. I'm going to go ahead and just go back in my preview slightly. Let me just make sure that this function's okay. One. Cool. Just going through these items one by one. I want to make sure this appears okay. Cool. How often do I listen to this musician? Looks good to me. So you can finish your preview. Oh. So what questions do folks have? So hopefully that gives you just a very quick sense of architect and how architect functions. Um, but I'm sure there's lots of 
questions that you guys might have when it comes to using Architect. How many folks have actually built a network canvas protocol already? That might not be helpful just to know too. Yeah, there's been a handful. Cool. Yes, I'm, I'm already, you can unmute yourself. Anyone actually. Uh, um, and, and again, I have not built, so this is all kind of a philosophical for me. <laughs> I'd love to talk to the people that have built. Um, but for instance, um, uh, say that I wanted to do a social network analysis for young adult cancer survivors. Um, and that would be my first part of the study. And then I wanted to do um, some peer driven um, health promotion support. And so in some work that I've been doing, those people have been kind of randomly assigned, but I see for instance, you've just shown us some of this stuff in Architect where we can kind of see people's likes and the whole nine yards. So is it possible, so not only to do the analysis in the whole nine yards, but then to also kind of extrapolate, okay, these peer connectors seem, again, this is not part of their own peer connector, but this particular person, test ID 02, seems to like musician X and you know a, a good portion of their friends are non-family members. Um, so they may resonate um, in a peer connector group where there's, um, you know, participatory learning. Is that something that even makes sense to do? And you're not going to offend me at all if you say, <laughs> absolutely not. Because again, I'm really just learning and I'm sorry if I'm taking- No, no, not, I, I, I think what you're trying to ask though is an important question. I think it's like, um, you can get a lot of data really quickly. And I think that's one of the dangers almost is that you can capture so much so easily that you sort of at the back end are you're left with a lot of data that you now have to analyze and figure out exactly like, how is this relevant? And how do I put this into my models? Um, and that's the hard part. I mean, data capture, what, you know, hopefully this like resolves the data capture process, in a lot of ways, but it doesn't resolve the fact that, you know, network modeling is still pretty complicated. And, and I think it's um, really important that you go into any data capture with a very strong understanding of why are networks important for your study, for your population, what, why are they useful? And what's the mechanism that is important for you to capture exactly? Um, you might, I mean, potentially you don't know. And then so maybe the role of this is just in starting to gather some ideas. And then maybe it's a little bit more mixed methods or qualitative. Maybe it's more discussions to start to get an understanding of the mechanism before you're starting to go in with um, trying to obtain a really quantitative uh, understanding um, because you need to be specific there because it can get you know, when you say and network, I hear you, I hear you. And I think exactly that, like I would, mm -hmm. my first question is, um, how are sexual gender minorities, uh, as we do, you know, kind of um, support for health behaviors? Um, who is there? Is it really their family member, which yep. literature seems to think not? But so yeah, I see what you're saying. Don't muddy the waters by kind of throwing everything into the into the pancake mix. <laughs> yeah, it's like exactly because I think one of the cool things is is like so what specific name generator you use is going to completely change what data you're getting, what network you're getting. So you know if you say who do you hang out with most often physically, that's a different network than who do I communicate the most with, especially if your definition includes like texting or something, or who is my biggest support? So I think it, it's really thinking about who, like for your specific area that you're interested in, what, which network is most important and why? Is it because of the physical support? Is it the tangible support? Is it because of the emotional support? Is it asking the name generators that are very much connected to who is supportive of you about, you know, your gender and sexuality, whoever, who are you out to? Um, all of these things will, will give a different system. So you just want to be careful 
you know, and, and maybe you want the folks who aren't supportive. And if that's the case, then, you know, you want maybe a very different name generator. Yeah, I mean, that that's, you know, been my biggest struggle as well with my work is just trying to think about specifically what is important to capture because you can have so much and then but what, why are we capturing all this unless you're really going to utilize it other questions and it's okay if they're you know more big picture um because these are important things too yeah um you uh did a great job uh giving us an overview thank you so much just quick wanted to say that. Um, and I really appreciate too, that there are so many options on the website to go in and kind of play around while you're getting, wrapping your head around how everything works. Um, specific question about software updates. Mm -hmm. um, do you, um, you know, I'm getting ready to start my study. Do you, have yeah. you seen any issues with, you know, I built my protocol, I'm ready to use it. Um, but like this morning I, I logged in, um, to grab my um, interviewer and I saw that there was an update. So I did go ahead and quickly update that and then um, upload the protocol into the, the updated version. Um, when a person is in the middle of a study, do you anticipate any um, issues with software updates? Should you stick with the, the one that you built the protocol in? I think the biggest, um, we try not to. I would say the only time that you're going to maybe have issues is when the schema version for that protocol changes. So that means like something about the underlying logic of how protocols are constructed is going to shift in some way, which might make it a little bit like we hope not to break things when we do update the schema, but it, it potentially could, especially if the schema is fixing some bug that might have existed. Maybe you didn't experience, but other researchers did that we found. Um, and then, so in that case, there's always the possibility that when you're updating a protocol to a new schema, it might act in a different way. Um, something that either we could fix, but it's also something you might not want to do when you're in an active data collection. So if you're in an active data collection, I would suggest probably, I mean, you know, you can always check with us to make sure. I would say probably don't make updates that are going to upchange the schema, because I think that might lead to some issues. Um, if you do encounter any issues, contact us and we can help you navigate, you know, either back to a prior version or help to update your protocol or, but the way things are supposed to work is when you create um, a protocol, it's with a certain schema. And then if our software updates to a, a higher version of that schema, it should um, create a copy of your protocol so you don't lose it in that new version of that schema, and it should update it for you. And it should be seamless, but when you're in active data collection, you might not want to take a few days to iron out any kinks that might happen, so. Thank you for that recommendation, appreciate mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Questions? I feel like I, I zoom through some of this stuff, so I'm happy to, to go back to things. I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Please. So first, uh, I was wondering if there is any limit of how many authors you can select in the visualization. So for example, when we're trying to reach ego networks, but actually when we're trying to reach personal networks, it's a lot of bigger. So maybe mm -hmm. that could be problematic just to know mm -hmm. beforehand of using this in another interview. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of it is limited by your display size, honestly, and what your participants find manageable. Um, within our studies, we've done up to 40, um, and it's worked mm -hmm. pretty well. Um, I mean, I wouldn't do too much more than that, because I think it, it kind of just is too much. Um, we've also worked with folks who are using very large rosters of thousands of people, um, and that seems to be working okay, too. So. Um, it seems like, you know, pretty, pretty high. It shouldn't be a, um, a huge limiting factor for you. It's more about what is, um, 
able to be comprehended by your participant, which, which, you know, for all of this, I would say after you build it, try it yourself, try it a lot yourself, and then try it with some sample participants before deploying it, because they will point out lots of things that are, oh, this, this is a really confusing sentence. I don't know what to do here. Um, I think that's always really helpful. Yes. And I have another question about mm -hmm. the roster uh, questions, because I was wondering if you can have the roster kind of question and then add in other names in the moment. Like for example, if I have the roster of a classroom mm -hmm. and that month appear a new <laughs> classmate, uh, a new person in the class, and I didn't know as interviewer, but the, it, that person is mentioned in the field world, uh, it could be added in the moment like yeah yes you're going to do it on a different name generator though so you would um if you're utilizing the the roster name generator um correct me if i'm wrong uh gregory or, or hella but i don't think you can add another person on the na roster name generator it's really meant to just be dragged and dropped from a pre-existing list yes. but i would then think of my data capture as being i'm capturing node type person but I'm using a couple of different interfaces or stages to capture that. Maybe the first stage is the roster. And then the second stage might be um, a name generator with a form. So if was there anybody else that wasn't um, named in the roster that we just looked at who you would add, for example? Perfect. And that actually leads to my last question. I, I, it's really the last one. <laughs> so uh, I was wondering about when you use a lot of different name generators in one survey. Uh, I know obviously this is not ideal because the person could get tired and all those stuff. But if you're interested in using, for example, constructed the complete network from one side, then an ego network from another one, um, how do you do it to uh, not collapse all those when you can then export the data? Uh, so for example, if you have a lot of different uh, complete lists, um, I don't know if I explain myself, <laughs> uh, like when you have uh, different dimensions and you are asking from the same roster, when you then export the data, it's going to be differentiated by different mm -hmm. variables or is going mm -hmm. to be using the same roster so in that sense it's just uh if you answer one person one in the first question then in the question two is going to disappear that person because you're using the same roster or um, is, i'm not 100 uh, sure I'm, I'm understanding i i i I, get, I think the confusion a little bit is around how um, is data, so, you know, you have these multiple rosters that are creating individuals, or you have multiple different stages, name generators that can pull individuals. And then you can also not only use multiple name generators in the same interview to create your list of nodes, but you mm -hmm. can also have multiple kinds of nodes you can also have multiple types of relationships with those people. Um, so it's not that they disappear, you know, between stages, because you can certainly, bet in between stages, you can draw from existing nodes, you can draw from existing relationships that you've already queried upon. So I kind of think of it as, I mean, as you go through the stages, anything that was generated in a prior stage can be pulled from and more information gotten from it. So you could set up a survey. So say that you only want um, only persons, for example, and you are going to use your name generators to ask for who are the people who um, are you know, supportive of me and who are people who are conflictual with me and so maybe I have a list of 20 people, 10 and 10 who are supportive and 10 who are conflictual, something like that. And then um, you can ask a lot more information throughout the interview on, on those. You could also set up completely differently where you have two different types of nodes, where you have supportive people 
are one type of node and supportive people, um, conflictual people are another type of node where it's much more separated. And that would be another way of potentially going about the name, the, the data capture process. Um, there could be also um, another way of doing this. That's a third way, completely different. Maybe it's just people, you know, you get a list of 20 people and then maybe later on throughout the interview, you're asking them tap on all the people that are supportive of you and then tap on all the people that are conflictual with you. So in each of these ways, you're kind of getting the same data, but it's structured very differently in the back end of how the variables will be created. And so I think as an as the researcher, like you might want to think through what is going to make the most sense for you, be the easiest for you, matches most with like how the data will be utilized. Um, does that help? Am I starting to answer the question or did I miss something? Yeah, I was also wondering about the fact that when you add the variable information, uh, you also have the type of node and you have, for example, I remember in the example that you show, you show a person and musician. Yes. So yes. that is a way to differentiate yeah. between the nodes. So if, for example, mm -hmm. I want to construct different networks with the same roster, yes. maybe it could be useful to use different nodes. In that exactly. Case. Like yeah. roster one, and I create different names. If not, it's going to be the same. Yes. The only thing I would think about is that as things are currently set up right now, two different types of nodes aren't able to have connections between each other. So if you do mm -hmm. want people from one roster to be able to connect to another node type, that currently is not possible, although in the future, we think it'll be a future feature. Um, so that might be just something to think about. Perfect, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering, I think it's a little bit in line with uh, what Francisca was asking for Lisa so regarding the, when you export the data, so yeah. I'm guessing that you get a one graph file per network. Correct, yeah. Different yeah, networks. and and it'll have like different edge types. It'll, yeah, and it'll have within the different node types, it'll have um, um, what type of node it is. Right, right. Oh, and sorry, when you when you export the, the graph ML file, so do you preserve the layout of the of the network when they? The... I believe layout is um, kept. Gregory Halla, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting I nods. Think so. I think so. I know at one point it definitely was, and I think it still um, currently preserves layout. I'm not sure if it's automatically. Like I don't know if um, when you open the Gephi file, if it automatically will detect what the layout should be. But I think it's something that you it's it's captured as a variable of the nodes, the layout, the XY coordinates. And so you can absolutely set those nodes to have those coordinates like within gap or something. Oh, OK, OK, OK. So, so yeah, so it's uh, okay. so it might not be as a layout per se, but it's a, it's a, it, the coordinates are captured as variables at, at the very yes. least features yeah. of the nodes. OK, exactly. So it's kind of cool you can have like different layouts. Oh, sorry, I see. So then uh, is it that you get, if you have a, if you're using the same set of nodes, two different graphs, are you then, are you, you still generate two different uh, graph ML files, right? Or is it the same, or is it the same graph ML file same. that, okay. But you just same. specify the type of tie. Mm hmm. So I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I would imagine then that some nodes, um, so say you have multiple node types within like a single um, GraphML file, um, if when you load it into something like Gephi, you might have some missing data across um, certain variables that were not captured about a certain node type. So it would just okay. be blank, for example. Okay, okay. Just to give you a a sense too, I'm just looking at architect. Um, yeah, so this is just the code book for that one. And like for person, there's a layout that is captured. More questions? Yeah, and this is more of um, uh, 
uh, geek type of question. <laughs> As a software developer myself, I, I'm wondering how how easy it is to build extensions for, uh, or or if it's even possible to build like extensions for Network Canvas. Um, I'm ju I'm just thinking, for example, on the type of questions that you can add. Uh, I see that you have like a different uh, interfaces and and uh, and ways that you can incorporate questions. I'm wondering, what if a researcher wants to create a new specific type of question that is not included? Is it possible to add it? I don't know, using some type of API or something like that. We currently don't have um, like an API set up. So, you know, if you wanted to, to add something, what it would probably be would be like, you know, doing it, going to our GitHub and, and trying to, you know, build off of that. Um, I mean, I think in some ways it's it's easy, but it, it also it doesn't happen very often where, where um, that actually happens. We're more than happy though to, you know, if you're interested in that, you know, come meet with us and we can talk you through it. We can maybe, um, you know, get you started and, and talk, maybe give you some hints and tips of uh, how to make it easier for yourself versus harder. Um, yeah, Gregory, Hala, any thoughts on that? Nothing beyond uh, you know. I mean, I mean, we're not the, Michelle and I aren't the developers of the team, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very much a Josh question. Yeah, but I mean, I would say in general, like we try to keep things open and, you know, but also it's just, I think like one of the difficulties with any kind of open source software is that it's a lot of work to, to add anything to anything and to make it usable and it's a big commitment. So you don't see it happening as often as it probably should, um, so. You need projects like this, I think, to make tools like this happen sometimes. Um, and unless there's like a very specific thing, very specific reason with some resources behind it, oftentimes extensions don't necessarily always happen. But yeah, I mean, George, you know, let us know if there are ways that we can help facilitate this. We we have worked with some folks um, and and tried to help them along, but I don't know if too much has happened um, with those. Operations. I, we haven't checked in in a few months. Yeah, no, but I think that you guys are doing all the, um, you're doing things great because I, I um, compared to other projects around, this is, uh, I think it's, you are putting a very high standard for open source, uh, open source software development. So, and I can see that the quality is great. Uh, um, so yeah, as a, again, so thinking from the, from the eyes of a developer myself, I really like this software because it, it, it is very robust. It seems to be very like professionally well designed, which is a concern that I have sometimes when it's a concern I think that everybody has when you're using open source software. Yeah. But the fact that you have this uh, has been funded and you have like pay professional developers to do it, it's it's amazing, I think. Thanks. Thank you. I, I feel like we really want to like, like we really do believe in that. Like we really want this to be like a long-term resource that eventually the community is able to support in and of itself, you know, and, and we get people invested in it. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard, you know, it's it's really hard. So we would love for folks to enter into that space. And if you're interested in something, please, you know, we would love to see that. Um, but yeah, it's it's just, it's hard doing this work. You know, there's so many different reasons why. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and, and sorry to go on, on through this uh, line of discussion. It's just that I'm very interested in this kind of stuff. But yeah, have you ever thought about like doing some sort of like a hackathon for yeah. Network Canvas? So that could be a way to like uh, start incorporating others into into this. Uh, I imagine, uh, again, like a day, it could be virtual and, and inviting people who is interested in this, like who want to build new questions and new things. So a hackathon could be something very fun and very good for the project to do. I'm I'm curious. I mean, I you know, I think that would be great if we could like get people who would like have those skills and would be interested. But I'm curious about like from your perspective, what do you see as like the audience that would be interested in that? Like, is it in the social network community itself or is it outside of that a little bit? I'm yeah, I think it's uh it's it's kind of both. Um I see, for example, I guess thinking out loud here, uh, people who is uh, heavily invested in this kind of stuff 
uh, you have the people from Statnet who mm -hmm. might think about something to be added to it. I don't know how it could be connected, but uh, myself that I, I do, I do develop a, a lot of like network software. Uh, people like um, I don't know. There are a lot of R packager developers who are in, in network science, social network yeah. analysis, and True. this kind of stuff as, as well. So I'm thinking, I don't know about the uh, uh, out loud idea. Maybe there already exists, but an R package to load network canvas uh, files, for example. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. When you like see about stuff, you have a bunch of things, mm -hmm. and if you have a way to like just read all of that into R. That'll be great, I think, because I, I want to say that most of the researchers who are who are using this because of the mm -hmm. community are using R. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that kind of stuff. I don't know. So it could be uh, around any um, uh, any of those venues. But I think that they might, they might be interesting, uh, interest uh, for sure, uh, both in the network uh, social network community and um, people who are kind of in the network science. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, David Shosh, uh, Shah. David Schoch, uh, who I don't know if Francisca knows, he's in uh, base. Is he in, in Switzerland right now? Uh, he's, in well, he's in Cologne. He's in Cologne. And he is very like an advocate for open source software. He's like very, I don't know if you know him, but he has like some great projects about like data visualization layout and stuff like that. And I'm sure that if you will invite him, he will probably say yes <laughs> to whatever you invite him that it's open source software and related to networks, he will log to anything like that. So yeah, I'm sure that there's like a cool. plenty of people who might be interested. Awesome. These are great ideas. We you know appreciate this kind of insight and um, help and making sure that we're taking full advantage of existing interest and resources that are out there um, and getting folks involved. So thanks. I, I appreciate it. No, thank you. Uh, well, if uh, there's no more, any more questions, uh, I just want to thank you again, uh, Michelle, uh, Gregory, you. and Ha. So this is this was great. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, I think that people is like very happy. Some of them had that le left there a bit earlier told me that they were like loving this. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much again for uh, sharing this time with us. And uh, the video, I'm going to uh, as as soon as I as it's uh, live. Um, Sorry, uh, this is compiled. I'm going to um, share with you guys, and we can coordinate yeah. it on. So who will post it on YouTube? But but it'll be available for everyone That's later. That's wonderful. Thanks everybody, and thanks for you know joining and just being interested. And please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, join our newsletter. Um, info at Network Canvas is a great direct line to us. So thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. And thank you, George, for setting this up. No, no, thank you, thank you.